and welcome to another edition of Extra Connections. I'm James Law Jr. and I'm here to connect you with people, places, things, and ideas. The show is about five years old. Can't believe we've been doing it that long. And I have a guest. Is somebody I like talking to the younger brown men in my life. We'll see what they're talking about, what's going on with them. He is uh, Pakistani, correct? Yes, sir. Pakistani American, uh, comedian, producer, podcaster, on-air talent. He's in with the Samoans. We're gonna talk about that. Um, and he and I have a connection. So we're going to talk about all of that. Uh, he has two names. I'm going to say them both. Hamza Shah Khan, but also Hamza Mania. Hey, there you go. I'm like, I'm like Sharon Beyonce. Hamza Mania is my Sharon Beyonce name, you know, stage name. <laughs> <laughs> Hamza Shah Khan, that's my birth name, you know. That's so, your government name. That's, like that's my name. government name. That's what they call me. That's what they pull me over and, and call me whenever they pull me over. <laughs> you know, so I love it. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> Oh man, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna dig. I'm just gonna dig right in because I want to actually talk about you being a male other in America. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to always say, I used to work for the airport police, and she's like, "Oh, you know, you have the Asians, you have the blacks, whites, and you also have male other." Mm -hmm. When it what you are. So you're Pakistani. You've been here what 30 years at this point? I think this year, right? Yeah, 30 years. 30 years yeah. Um, Oh, should I say congratulations? I don't know how you, I don't know what you say to that. <laughs> congratulations! It You're could be a lot worse, is all I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? It's, it could be a lot worse. There's many, many more terrible places I could spend 30 years at. It's very, very, very true. Um, but I want to ask you, because America is so black and white, we kind of, that's the main thing, we kind of, like, you always forget there's other things out there. Um, first of all, what are you mistaken for? <laughs> I'm uh, not not ever really mistaken for much other than asked a lot of what I am uh where are you from and it's it's kind of an odd thing because I'm I'm totally okay with people asking by the way like I, I love people inquiring and and just trying to figure out who you are and where you're from and things like that it just makes people more interested in you right. um the weird thing is when you see people kind of stuttering and stumbling when they're trying to ask because they want to word it correctly you know that's the part that throws me off but no, I mean, I get anything from, from I mean, some, someone called me Guatemalan the other day. I mean, I've gotten Egyptian, which is pretty, uh, I can see Egyptian a lot, you know. Yeah. Uh, one guy even said I look French, which was kind of weird, but, you know, uh, okay. it, it, he was drunk and it was Hollywood Boulevard. So you already know how that goes. <laughs> yes, I've been called many things too on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> um, you know, I, but it's funny because I know uh, in, the, in the last, I mean, you've been here 30 years, so you know what's gone on here race-wise. But the last year or so, we've had a lot, the last eight months, I even say a year, a lot has gone down. Do you do you see do you, does do you see yourself as a as a brown man in America? Like, what does that look like? I mean, what is that? How do you I mean, how do you categorize yourself? That's it's funny you say that because I, I go around and this is in a jokingly manner, but I'm kind of serious. But I preach to everybody that I am America, and the reason why I preach I am America is because if you guys are listening to this right now and you're not visually watching this, you won't think I look the way I look. And then if you watch me. Uh, the way I look, then, you know, you're going to understand that, okay, this is a different person. And then you see the way I dress and you're like, okay, that son of a bitch is not as white as I thought he was. You know, it's, it's, I am the melting pot that you guys were hoping for. I'm doing this country. I'm doing the America the right way. That's how I feel. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, I have like a very white sounding name. So I mm -hmm. know my life, especially pre, I'm a little older than you are, <clears throat> pre all this social media stuff. Uh, I'm like your older brother, I can say. I won't say that. Okay, I'll okay. take that. I mean, well, I'm in my fifties. So I could probably play you. I be your. I have daughters your age. I could be your dad. Um, <laughs> but let's get let's get real. Let's just get real. No, but here's the thing. So I, you know, I have a white, I mean, a white sounding name. A name that has no James Lott Jr. has no. And my name is James Harrison Lott Jr. So it's like there's no, <laughs> no culture in there whatsoever. None whatsoever. None. I mean, none. And it was done on purpose. I was told later it was done on purpose. All, all my brothers were all named benign. Regular names. I mean, that's like, so sad. That's so sad if you think about it, though. That's very yeah. sad that that your parents had to do that in order to position you in life to succeed. You know, that's it's a sad thing. So, but they were smart for doing it. <laughs> they still, they, they didn't forget that you still see me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, but my thing was no. no I, actually, I agree with you on that. I think it's a, it's a sad thing, a commentary. But the thing was, and on phone calls, on resumes, I would they would expect something else to walk through the door of course uh, and i got i got a lot of those oh, oh okay um or this um oh so uh we're looking for james lott jr i'm like I'm right yep. here. james lott jr i mean no but i mean looking for james lott jr i'm like i'm, I'm right here oh okay okay come on in okay yeah, yeah. Hey. 
I get, yeah, I've got, I've got, I actually got that too. Believe it or not, actually at a, at a job interview once, because a lot of my expertise when it comes to work, regular everyday work is, is building relationships with other companies for a company to get them to grow. So it's always over the phone for the most part. Um, and then one lady actually called me and she was the only one that admitted it. And I told her I respected her for admitting it, admitting it, but she said she almost didn't call me in because of my name because she thought I'd have an accent. And therefore, yeah, and I was like, that's kind of terrible for you to say, and I'm also not going to accept this job, but you know, I, yeah. I appreciate you telling me that. So at my resume, the very first, my cover letter, the first thing it says is, even though my name sounds like this, don't be alarmed, I sound American. Like, it's just, and it's an icebreaker for them too. People love that shit. He sounds as white as his teeth. I, that's shit. That's what we came here for, all right? <laughs> I know, I love it. I, but you know, and it, it's funny, because you're right, it's, it's that weird thing where, you know, sometimes they feel the need to tell you sometimes their racism kind of like, yeah. <laughs> you know, James, at first I was just like, wasn't sure about you, but then I saw you and you're so, you're, you speak so well. Um, thank mm -hmm. you. Oh my God. Fuck you. I quit. <laughs> um, you know, exactly. It's like, it's like they, they have no problem telling us how you feel about that. But I mean, I do in America, it's kind of like, it's, you know, there is South Asian because they always think of Asian as like just strictly Chinese, Japanese, but there's some mm -hmm. that's Korean now because of all the K-pop. But there is other South Asian Indian. I mean, if that I mean like there's no Indians here, it's first peoples and Native Americans, but there's Indians, right. Pakistan, and all stuff. So, I mean, what has been your overall experience with America in America, being Pakistani American? Um, it's been kind of a, a challenging experience when it comes to finding myself identity wise. That was the only like main issue I had. Um, sure. People said things to me. Sure. People have, have, uh, maybe discriminated against me in certain things that I, uh, just from the way I look and whatever it is, that stuff never really bothered me because the way I've always been is if I'm not wanted somewhere or liked by somebody that's on them, that's their problem. Right. Um, if I feel like you're, 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 I mean, I'm not speaking for anyone else other than myself, just to right. clarify. Right. Uh, but the hardest part has been like, um, Finding things to wear, for example. Like if I dress too much like a white guy, everyone said I was looking like a white guy. Then I would dress something like I would wear Jordans because I like Jordans. Now I'm trying to be a black guy, you know? And it was the weirdest thing. So, and I grew up in Texas. So all we think we had was black, white, and Mexicans. Yeah. yeah. That, that was the hardest part in my opinion of growing up here is that one, um, because we were the first generation here, I didn't have any cousins or brothers or sisters, uncles, aunts to look to like, hey, how do we do things? Uh, and then secondly, I would just have to observe people and I would try to do what they were doing creating this weird kind of like odd shaped personality that didn't really wasn't really mine but i was trying to appease to what everyone else was doing around me that's interesting you know i can't really thought about that part um about the way you dress i mean i mean i know i mean no i i can't say that i mean i know what that i mean people uh, cultural appropriation that kind of thing but i never yeah. use for interesting because I, again i just brown i wouldn't even know i wouldn't even know what you are at first, right. at you. and if you were around, you know, you could one of my cousins. Trust me, if you just <laughs> right in the family, wouldn't even know a difference. Right, right. Uh, you know, so I wouldn't. But so I'm thinking dress wise, I guess I wouldn't. Yeah, but I do understand the white thing because I grew up in the '80s, and so wearing polo shirts and things like that was very white. Yeah, also meant status. Yep. So met you, you get that guest jacket with you know that stonewashed guest jacket, kids. <laughs> I thought I was like rich. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was such, but it was such a weird thing because. Then in the '90s came out Fubu and Sandra. That then then we had yeah. stuff that came out for like black people, so to speak. Um, but I remember that. So it's funny you said. I just it just took me back to my time of that. Oh, you're just like a white boy. Oh, you're an Oreo. Yeah. You know, you're a zebra. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, why is, I got nice clothes. I don't know. I don't right. I, It was there were not, it was, there was nice clothes. It was nice quality clothes for a decent price. Like. Like that, that's the thing, like, because in Houston, when I grew up, uh, I grew up in a majority black school and my parents, you know, they start to make them sound ignorant or anything, because obviously it's one of those things where it's like they don't know anything about this country. The only thing they can go off of is the news and the media. And that's it. And we all know how that can fuck your perception up. Right. Part of my language. Yes. But it's it's so, so then my friends are wearing FUBU and stuff at school or people I go to school with. And I'm trying to get my mom to buy me these shirts and stuff. And they're so big. And she's like, you're not wearing that. You're not wearing that. And so I would dress like a white kid in school in a predominantly black school and everyone would look at me like, what the hell, you know? And then the weird thing was this, and I know they did this on purpose because our school was like 30% whites. And I would say about 60% or 50% blacks and about the rest of it was mixed, Mexicans and everyone else. And I swear to you, they would put us in classes together based on color of our skin because I would always be in a class full of blacks and not the whites. And the only reason I knew that is because my neighbors were white and that's who I was friends with, but we never had classes together. And then as I grew up older and older, older, I started realizing like, wow, they're separating us in our high schools 
And I don't even think they know that they're doing it cognizantly, but it was, it was like a shit moment for me, you know? Yeah. I, 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 you see my eyes getting big. I'm like, I thought I've heard all the racist <laughs> things in my life. That was something. Now I've been yeah. to Houston. I've been to Houston. It's the uh, fourth largest city in America. I think third or fourth right. largest in America. It is huge. Um, I had some really good, um, some good barbecue there when I was there. Oh yeah. Uh, and it's, it, it, it is, it is very, I mean, it's a lot of black folks there. I, I was like, oh, I did not realize that. And a lot yeah. of Latino, you know, I did not realize that until I, I went there. Uh, had a good time. In a very good way too, in a very good and like healthy amount of way, you know? In Houston, like I love the I love the diversity there because it is a lot of minorities that are making it diverse. Not just that there's a lot of whites there mixed in with sprinkles, right? It's it's like a there's a lot of blacks there and there's a lot of uh, very successful black owned businesses out there, very successful uh, black groups out there that that keep their communities up and running and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of in fact I think Houston slept on when it comes to that a little bit, in my yeah. opinion. Well, so okay, so for you, so trying to find your identity. Did you relate more to black folks then, kind of, or a white? Or were you just, were you just like stuck no, out your fourth thumb? Man, black black people didn't like me growing up. I, yeah. That's how I feel. That they used to pick yeah. on me, but it, 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 I, I I'm starting to understand more that I grow up. Why? Because you know, it's it's the whole speech thing. It goes both ways. It's it's I was I only learned my English through textbooks. I didn't watch TV in the '90s. We didn't get to watch movies and stuff unless it was Disney. So like we didn't even get to watch Titanic. You know. Right. So my dad my dad kept us very like in a small bubble so when i learned my english i learned it through textbooks and in our culture our intelligent is is intelligence is measured by how well you speak english because it's a second language uh english was my third language and when i learned it i learned a textbook and when i would speak it i guess people thought i felt as if i was better than them or i just didn't fit in and i actually had to I had to force myself to speak in broken English, broken, if you will, if that's what you want to call it, or like try to speak slang. And it sounds so uncomfortable being me like, what's up, yo? Like, that's not me, you know? So it's, it was just an odd, like uh, growing up was so fucking weird. It was, it was appeasing my parents, but then everyone hated me in society. But then if I try to put peace society, my parents would get pissed off. That's, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> so crazy. I ask, so I was gonna ask, but it's crazy, but I was gonna ask you, so because you didn't have a huge, Pakistani community obviously around you how so your parents must have kept that very I mean kept that tradition really strong in the house right yeah I mean our household was very strict it was very strict in fact I remember one time my dad because he got me a six disc changer cd changer I remember those I remember, I remember my, those oh my god I was so excited with it but he wouldn't let us listen to anything other than uh Indian Bollywood music right and then so one day my parents were leaving out to go somewhere <laughs> me and my sisters were left home alone and i got a the the will smith uh miami cd you know well, remember remember that? That? Yes, I remember the that. cleanest <laughs> rap you can find and i plugged it in my dad walked back in because he forgot his wallet he lost it he went and broke the cd player and everything he was just like this is not happening in my household i'm like it's the cleanest most pure rap you can find out there which is will right, smith. yeah completely he doesn't even curse like oh. But oh. it, it, yeah, they, my dad my dad hated anything that had to do with culture he wanted us to stay pakistani but grow up in america it was weird but you know, his mindset was we only came here for the education and and to make something of ourselves, not to take in the culture. But if you raise somebody around a certain culture, that's what they're gonna pick up as they move on. You know, I I have a very strong connection to the Indian community because I have relatives who are Indian from India, and I I did a show at Afterbus TV called Bali What. My girl, oh, I would have loved to be part of that. I I, I, I almost want to start it again because I I grew up with Bollywood movies and the whole mm -hmm. history of them, and I I love I love the whole thing. I, love, I mean I love it. So me too, me too. They yeah. do. I mean it's fun. It's fun, and it's I mean I know all the folks like John Abraham and Shah Khan mm -hmm. and all. Them. I know I know everybody. I know everybody. I was oh, like, you like the new age? You like the new age guys? I'm more of the old school. I'm, I'm into well, I like the old school, school too, but I mean I, but I mean I like the new ones too. And you know there's some fun movies that were they, and they started to do things that are different. There was a movie called Dostana that came out years ago. It was very yeah. Different. They really come to us. I, I trust me. I know my. I know my body. I, I can so, tell, man. I can tell. I you definitely do your research on everything. Like, smart. That is me. I uh, can't help it. The Taurus in me, I guess. Um, right. but no, I, I. But I have a strong connection to, to Bollywood, and so when you said that, I was like, yeah, I used to work on that all the time. Um, so that's interesting. So, because I, I come from different cultures, also, um, mm -hmm. and and it's funny to have them try to hold on to that culture and give it to you, which now as an, as an adult, I get it. Mm-hmm. As a kid growing up, it was an annoyance on some level. Was that the same experience for you, kind of? Uh, it got it got a little combative in a way. It became a, to a point where we had to fight a lot for it. And it was when the fighting happened, 
um, it made me feel like I was like a, a bad son because that's how my parents made you feel. So it made me like, uh, cause I'm a really, really good, I'm a really good kid. I would tell you that growing up, one thing I was is I was so into being good and goodness and making sure everything was done the right way. Uh, I actually didn't even drink alcohol till I was 23. And my dad flipped out about that too. So it was, the, it was the weirdest thing, but it was, it was a lot of uh, com combat, uh, combating with my dad and my mom to try to get them to understand. And slowly but surely we, we cracked a little bit through them, um, got through to them. But the benefit that came from that is my younger siblings are now getting to be a little more like open and doing what they want to do, go out where they want to go and, you know, responsibly still, because my siblings are just really good, really good kids. But um, as they're growing up, they're getting to be themselves more, which they might not even appreciate. But now I know what our parents feel like, you know? How many siblings do you have? There's five of us total, so four siblings. Are you the oldest? Second oldest, but I come off as the oldest because I'm the oldest son. So, oh, you, you know, know how that goes. Yeah. You know how that yeah. goes. My, my sister, she's my oldest sister is wonderful. She's only a year older than me, and she's probably one of the closest people in my life. Uh, the only thing about her is that she's very much, um, how can I put it? More self-centered than anything else. There you go. So, yeah, be the older okay. sister. Don't really, really really do something be. thoughtful. Let me think of something careful. Self-centered. Yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. self that's the best way to put it. Self-centered. She's smart though. She's a doctor. She okay. became a doctor and everything, but but you know she's, she's self-centered. Self so a doctor. Yeah. She'd be self-centered. Yeah, that's all that. All that. All that. All that. All that uh, the, the I hope she's not listening. <laughs> I hope she is. I'm gonna find her and tag her in this. Um, <laughs> That's not, but you know, your firstborn, I mean, firstborn's oldest son. That's always a big, a big deal. How young are your younger siblings? Uh, the so it's I'm 33. I'll be 34 in two weeks, and then my brother is 25. Oh and wow. then my other sister, my oh my, before my brother is my other sister who's 30. So 30, 25, and then 18. Oh, okay. yeah. Your parents did spread out though a little bit. They're spread like, out, man. Like every they're, three years, it's like I mean that's. Um, yeah, you know what you know what it is, and it's it's weird because they have to have a specific time of the year that they 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 like to consummate. Because <laughs> my sisters, my sisters are all one, one's nineteen, the other's thirty, the other's thirty five, and they're all born in August eighth, eighteenth, and twenty eighth. What? And I'm like, there's got to be a time frame. We all got you guys are just in love that month, okay, whatever month it is. Like, we're doing it. I'm trying to think nine months before then. That's like no, that's why it's December, December, right? Oh yeah, so for my birthday. For my birthday, they're like, all right, let's go ahead and get some more siblings for this guy. <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny. Oh my god, I like that. Um, that's that's very interesting though. And they're all ended eights. Eight, eight, yeah, eight, eight, eighteenth, and twenty eighth. Can't even. You can't even screw that shit. You can't even. Nah, it's so weird. Okay, so Hamza, young Hamza, is 18 years old. Well, I don't know. When did you graduate high school? What, what age did you graduate high school? I was 18, yeah. Okay, so you graduate high school. Young Hamza is 18 years old. Do you go buck wild or do you go into college? Like, what did you do next? Like, because now yeah. you're an adult. They literally are an adult, basically. That, that's weird. You're actually bringing up things I've never even talked about before. Yeah, but no, that's, that's my point. That's my point. <laughs> weird. You're doing your job, man. Is this what this is what you guys do, you journalists? No, <laughs> no it was um, it was that was a really high school was a really rough point in my life because we, uh, my parents went through some financial issues in Houston, and my mom, all of her siblings, aunts, uncles, everybody were in Florida, and huh. my mom wanted to move to Florida, and I graduated in 2005, but in 2003 they decided to move us to Florida, which sucked because that was my 10th grade year, you know, in high school. Yeah. So at this point, I grew up all all the way in Texas. We went to Florida. And a year later, my dad stayed in Houston to work on his business. My mom and us, we went there. And a year later, they decided that this is not working out. Let's come back. So then 2003, we were in Florida. Then 2004 and five, I came back to Houston. And then in Houston at 2005, when I'm about to graduate, we had about six months left before I graduated. My parents decided they wanted to move to Orlando again. But without, without waiting for me to graduate, they actually got up. And without my, except for my dad, my family packed up and they went to Orlando. So I finished out high school by myself, and the day I graduated, walked through graduation without my family there, got in my car, and then drove to Florida the same day. Wow. Yeah, and then that's when I realized that this, uh, that then from the age of 18 to 22-ish, I lived a life of, I hate everything, this sucks, Florida sucks, and Florida sucks. Like, I don't know if you've been to Florida. I, I have made time, do I have made family there, I know. Oh my God, Florida. So Florida, will, if you're not a white person who's like lowly educated, they're going to make you feel like you, you don't belong in this place. Like, <laughs> and Florida sucked. Yeah. So then, like, then that's when I was like, okay, and I, and I took care of my family because that's how we do. So I worked, I made sure I took care of my family and everything like that. And it got to a point where I was doing too much for a family that wasn't like, not when I say not my family, I didn't, wasn't the one that got married and had kids, okay. you know? So that stuff shouldn't fall on my shoulders at that moment. So I started to 
go into a little bit of depression and stuff. And then my, one of my friends asked me one day, she's like, well, what, if you could do anything today, what would you do? It's like, I want to go to Hollywood. So she goes, why don't you? I kid you not. I was 22 years old. The day we talked about this, that same night, I packed my car and I drove to LA. What? Yeah. I drove 40 hours to LA in my car from Orlando, Florida to Koreatown, Los Angeles. Okay, wait, how, hey, so, okay, so let's stop there for a second. This is, this is fascinating. I didn't even yeah. know all this was like, when I decided to interview, I didn't even know all that. I'm getting, I'm getting like, you know, it's like Christmas for me right now. This is exclusive, right? If only yeah. it was bigger named or whatever, you can make millions of dollars off of this, but I'm oh, not about God, it. Oh, I hope so, shit. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm like, okay, so, oh my God, this is crazy. Okay, so how do you tell your family that day you're leaving? Well, this was a point where my family was moving back and forth. We moved within a five-year time frame. We moved 11 times. Oh my so there was something obviously going on. My parents weren't sharing with us. Right. Maybe it was financial, whatever it was. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's, no, there's no blame on their end on my end because from, right. from me. Because, like, how do you come to another country? I can barely go to another state and get along with okay. them. Okay, right. exactly. Country, where, like, the exact opposite is what you are, right? Yes, yes. So, so it, it's, it, they didn't like it very much. My dad was like not talking to me at all. And you know, he never talked to me in general. He was kind of like distant. But when I got there, here's the way they responded. This is where they let me know they actually weren't very happy about this. So I got to LA and back then the family would share an account, a checking account. So all of us worked and it all went into one checking account. Okay. Okay. I got to LA, I got to the Shell gas station in Koreatown. I went to go fill up my gas tank scared. and that shit got declined. So I'm like, wait a minute. I've never had, whoa, where did I go? I think I got frozen. There I am. Yeah. I'm like, I've never had my card be declined before. Like, this is new to me. So I was like, wait, I called the bank and they're like, yes, Mr. Khan, you know, you, you came in here yesterday and you closed your account. And I was like, no, I didn't. And then we're talking. So I called my dad and his exact words to me were, um, yeah, I told you I don't want you out there. So either come back and you can have the, the, the safety net of being here or you can be there on your own. Click. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Okay. It got I'm real. in the thick of things. <laughs> Shit got real. Okay. I don't have a place to go. Uh, checking accounts all froze up. I got my car. What do I do? Uh, I was stuck. I was stuck. I was like, okay, I can't even get in the car and drive back because 40 hours is a lot of driving. <laughs> like, yeah, I was like worn this. out. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. He was definitely trying to uh, trying to break me, though, to get me to come back. And, and you know, I decided to stick it out. So I was fortunate because, believe it or not, my best friend growing up in high school and stuff he was a year older than me he graduated a year before i did and he went off to the navy and he hit me up we always just talk about living in california and he hit me up and he was like hey guess what i'm being stationed in san diego and i was like well fuck patrick guess what i'm in la right now and he goes are you really i'm like yeah so we started talking a bit and i told him about what's going on and he goes well not for nothing the navy's putting me up in a two-bedroom in san diego so if you want to come stay here for a while you know feel free to do so so what was crazy was I was working at CarMax by LAX. Oh yeah, I know, I know, I know that one. I've been there. So for like for like two weeks, <laughs> I would sleep in my car in the front, and I had a gym membership to Twenty Four on Slauson, and I was oh, showering. Oh yeah, the, I know that on my house, like by my house. Yeah, yeah. Right, right by Slauson, right. Yeah. So that was I would go there and I would shower in the mornings and I go to work at CarMax, and then I and then when he called me and he said, "Hey, um, you know, I'm in San Diego. I drove to San Diego, and then every day I would get up and I would drive to LA to work and then come back two hours, two hours, two hours back and forth." And, uh, and then it got to a point where this was 2009 and it got to a point where in December, end of December, I actually got booked for a TV show called Hawthorne with Jada Pinkett Smith. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And then that, and then when that happened, I got a decent little, little check for it yeah. and nothing like the episodes didn't even air. I don't think so, because I think they canceled it two, two episodes okay. in okay. and then, but the checks were nice. And then I was able to get a spot in LA and then I finally got on my feet at that point and continued to build from there in 2010. That's amazing. Now I'm like a bigger crazy. fan right now than just, just hearing that story. Your story. That's crazy. Why do you think, okay, so it's a good, I, I get asked the same question all the time. So I'm going to ask it to you. Why do you think you, you survived? Why do you think you stuck it? Why didn't you just do, fold in the corner and like drive off into the ocean or like go back? I mean, why did you survive? You know, it's, it's the weirdest thing. I grew up in a, in a way where I felt like everyone looked at me like I wasn't anything and everyone would tell me all the time I wasn't anything. Uh, looking back at it in hindsight now, I realized that I was just smarter as a kid. And most people were are threatened by that, especially in the South. Like, right. So, so what got to me was I would always tell myself, even though no one else did, is like, there's something about you. I'm telling you, there's something about you that needs to be out in the world. And it sounds very uh, conceited in a way. I don't even like talking no, like this. But I, I was like, 
I was, I was, I was I meant for something. I feel like I, ever since I was born, I was meant for something. And the one thing I like to pride myself in is when I, when I enter someone's life, I always leave them in, a, in as a better person, you know? And I feel like that connection I have with people is kind of what I would like to sp spread out there. So that made me keep going. And it got to a point where it was like, man, it was hard because there was like no, I was eating chicken nuggets every day, but it was like, it was like, I know once you get there, once you get there, and this was 10 years ago, once you get there, you're going to realize like, damn, this was done for the right reasons. So I kept going for that. I, and I, I, I've started over several times, so I know what that feels like. And I remember, I, I, my mother told me this story the other day, because I remember James when you couldn't eat potatoes anymore because you had so many potatoes because you were so poor on your yep. There's a time where I could eat potatoes or eggs or macaroni and cheese. I could take macaroni and cheese in that box and make it 20 <laughs> ways for rest of me. Um, that's how poor I was at times. So you know, you know the struggle. Right? Oh, I, do. Oh, I, do. I totally don't. But to hear somebody your uh, your generation talk about it, it's very interesting for me because my generation we knew that kind of stuff. We knew you had to kind of work hard and blah blah. But you really you stuck it out. You stuck it out. You, you really did. Yeah. You stuck it out. I mean, that's that's um, that's amazing. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want my dad to. My dad was, and our people in a way are controlling. Um, are especially the men in our culture. They're very controlling. Uh, especially if you're, they're older than you. It's like this weird unspoken rule. If they're older than you, you have to respect them. And I give respect to everybody. I just don't tolerate disrespect. So the one thing my dad didn't like about me is I was very quick witted. So when an older guy would come and say something to me, I would always respond back real quick. And my dad thought that was disrespectful, but really it was just me as a kid, not letting someone bully me, you know? So, so it's, 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 to me, it was, it was, um, I'm grateful for all of it because it's, it, I'm so, if you talk to anybody that knows me today, there's, they're all like, how do you know how to do X, Y, and Z? How do you know how to do that? And it's just like, I just learned it because I kind of had to. And because of that, I feel like I'm so far along in life as far as skill sets are concerned. And it wouldn't have happened if I stayed in that bubble that my dad was providing me, you know? And it's going to help you in anything you do. People don't, people don't realize that life experience, street smarts, book smart, all that stuff does help you, even in entertainment. It helps you. Yeah. In, it helps you in everything. Like all that stuff helps you. It's it's the it's the way you handle something. It's right. What you do life as an entrepreneur or as an artist. I mean that that's what that's what it does. Exactly, man. Exactly. You know it. And it's a, that's that is that lack of like when you don't uh, fear failure. You know, it is what it is. We're gonna fail. In fact, I'm starting to enjoy failing so much now that it's like, oh shit, I didn't fail this time around. This was this was not bad. So it's just it's just one of those things. It grows, builds character. I encourage everybody to try to move out of their hometown if they can. Anyone listening, uh, just for a couple of years and experience somewhere else, somewhere different, and you'll it'll open your eyes a lot. Like there's so much ignorance in my brain growing up in the South that was washed away once I got out of it, and I'm so grateful for it too that I learned and grew up from there. You know. That's smart because I did. I left after high school, so I went off to, I went off to college or anything. But I left after high school. Left. Mm -hmm. little, I'm here in Inglewood. I'm back, of course. I'm back. Um, but it was years later. But I did live other places, and I travel. I tell people travel. I'm not talking about expensive trips to Europe. I'm just saying like go to other states. <laughs> right, go, right. Go to another county. I mean, it's like just drive around. I, I have friends who never left Los Angeles. I have friends in New York who mm -hmm. still live on the block they grew up on, and literally don't go further than a ten block radius. And their view is exactly. so small. It's like this small. I'm like, really? You, you know, I mean, not even Atlantic City or not even, I mean, not, like literally nothing. It's just, it's, it's just, I'm from Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn. It. It's Brooklyn. Yep. And that's it. And that's why, that's why the, the world is in such a crap place because they feed you. Because I'm in Florida and California, the two opposites of this country, right? Yeah. The two complete opposites of the country are Florida and California. Yeah. And every time I go to Florida, the amount of media that's fed to me on the red side is crazy. And then on, in California, the same thing happens on the blue side. But here's the kicker. I'm watching Pakistani news and they made it seem like in America, black men are walking down the streets and cops will see them and just shoot them. Like just rent. That's the way they are presenting the news. You get what I'm saying? So, so if I'm in Pakistan, I'm watching the news. I'm like, wow, being a black guy in America sucks. I mean, it does, but I'm not, not to that extent where you just walk down the street and get shot on a daily basis. Right, right. So, so it, it's, it's all about what they're feeding you. And then that's where the ignorance comes into play. And it's like, it's like, you know, you respond to things that you don't even know what you're talking about because you haven't had a chance to experience other people. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's pretty obvious what it is, but people still like taking that media. Let me get that drug, you know? And you were just in Florida recently, right? Because during the quarantine kind of thing, you were down there. 
What was that like for you, Hamza? Uh, it was actually a fun experience because after leaving my father 10 years ago to do what I wanted to do, I came back 10 years later and, and got him a house. I know. So. Congratulations. <laughs> that's, uh, that's so cool. Very cool of you. I saw that. Thank you. Thank you. It's actually going to be, it's, I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's going to be my property. Uh, you know, once they, they live out there, like, I just want them to retire somewhere nice. And it's a beautiful house. And that was like a big step for me growing up. Um, but also like if I ever, you know, once we talk about this down the line, but if I ever make it to WBE, which is my ultimate goal, uh, work-wise that's in Orlando. So I'm already set, you know? So it was, it was, it, it, don't get me wrong. I love, I love going back to visit Orlando. My friends are, are awesome there. Um, their kids are awesome. there, like watching everyone growing up, spending time with my family. Yeah. It's beautiful, but the, the entertainment and the, the lack of opportunity and stuff is not there. So when I come back to LA, the other part of me gets fulfilled, which is doing these shows and going on stage and things like that. Yeah. Um, how did it feel for you being able to purchase this house in your thirties? It, I didn't think it was going to happen. It, uh, you can ask the mortgage, mortgage people, the, the realtor, everyone, they, they were like, you're so, cause I was the one that did everything. I in fact, the commission should come to me. Because okay. I sat there and I did everything, paperwork. I'm talking about everything that they needed me to do because I'm so meticulous when it comes to reading things. And and once it happened and it closed, I was like, oh, shit, I'm a homeowner. Like, I own a okay. house. Yeah, it's right? Like, it's so crazy. Like, I can't, I never thought I would own a house. Like, that's weird to me. And I know I'm 33 or 34 now, but, like, I still feel like I'm 20. I still feel like I'm young. I get it. I get it. You know, it's like you're adulting now. Like, so like yeah, you've been an adult for you know 13 years or whatever. So right. like now you're like, because getting a car doesn't count. I'm sorry, folks. Getting a car, no, it does. Anybody have a car? Everyone has a. Everyone gets a car. Everybody, yeah. Oprah's out there giving everybody a car. So that's that's you know <laughs> that's not gonna count. I get it. No. Um. That yeah. That's yeah. That's a completely yeah. You can, that's fine. But getting out. I, I own several houses. When I got my first house, and I was uh, I got my first house in 2005. So I was. Nice. 36. Um, okay, close. Right. Yeah, so close. So again, I never thought it was going to happen either. I just thought, I'll never own a house. I, don't, I, just, I, just, I just never, I mean, it's too expensive. It's too this. It's too that. It's, I mean, you, you talk yourself out of stuff before. Yeah. But I got it. And <clears throat> I feel like an adult. I believe I've got now, even though I had kids, but this, but this may feel like an adult. Uh, I was like, I feel like this is actually something. Now I'm a, I'm a land homeowner. I'm like, this is right. I have Dynasty now. You know, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I, I am Blake Carrington, and I own Dynasty or some shit. Of like course. Are you and I own South Fork. I don't know. Yeah, but, but, it kinda, but that's how it's how it felt. But it was a great feeling. But for you to give something back to your parents, in a sense, the place to go. That's very good. Good son of you to do that. Yep. It was also it was also one of those things where it's like I I told you guys if you just were patient with me I can do this right like. And, and that ultimately that's what they want. They want me to get married, have kids, move them in, all that stuff too, and have a regular job, which I can do. It's just not interesting to me. And you know, it's, it's this country says life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. If I'm not pursuing my happiness, then what the fuck's the point, right? right like right. it's a never ending cycle of, of like people not loving their lives and it's gonna constantly keep going. And then you have kids before you can take care of them. And now you're stuck doing the same thing your parents did. And then you teach your kids to do the same thing. It's like, it's like a trap. And we're, and we're preaching this trap to everybody. No offense to anyone that's married and have kids, but right. we're preaching this trap to everybody because that's what keeps the economy going, right? If, if, if I have kids, I'm going to have to work. So the best way to get people, that's why they don't regulate people having kids or like get you to register and you can have 36 different kids with 36 different women if you wanted to. But, you know. My father but, did. Um, I'm, just, I'm just preaching. I'm preaching right now. I'm sorry, guys. I love sorry. it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's my show. You do whatever you want. I don't care. Yep. <laughs> uh, my father has 36 kids with me. Um, <laughs> he's a lot. He's a lot. Trust me. Good uh, for him. He, he, pursued, he pursued not just happiness. He pursued a lot of stuff. Um, but no, I, so I, now this leads me into the business. Okay. So which, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Like how, what was the first thing you did? You see, you, you got it, you got it in a roll. You see, there's some little acting here, but like beyond that first trying to get it together, what was the main part of the business that was first? So I did a lot of the acting thing and I hated a lot of the acting thing because they would always look at me, as you know, name and everything and say, hey, you're going to play terrorist number one uh, or yeah. Afghan militia number three and all that stuff. And it's like, <laughs> but you guys got to understand how funny I am. I'm telling y'all, like, put me in a comedy. It's like, I'll be a secondary character to somebody. I'll be the comic relief. But yeah. it was always that. It was always, always that. Uh, every agent I got was the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we love it. This is great. Wonderful. And then they would start pitching me and promoting me for that kind of stuff again. And to me, the reason I didn't care for acting much is because I like to entertain, but I like to entertain based off my creativity, what I've created. 
you know, and acting was reading someone else's lines and their ways and stuff like that. And that wasn't for me. One day I was selling a car, it's 2014. I was selling a car to a guy and he does like stand up and has done like true TV shows, the countdown shows and stuff like that. Really funny guy. And after I sold it, he told me he did stand up comedy and he's like, you should come down and check us out. So I went to Sal's Comedy Hole on, Mel on Melrose. Oh, yeah. I did a stand up there for five minutes and it was the worst okay. experience okay, of my wait, life. Wait, before, okay, wait, 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 wait. So someone, you sell a car to somebody who says, you should come on, check us out. How you, you guess skip over how do you get from checking someone out to suddenly you're doing five minutes of some horrible stand up? I mean, how, I mean, how did you, I mean, you say, did you always want to be, I mean, did you want to do stand up before? Like, what I mean, no, it's because I go, I go around roasting people all the time and it's just something fun I do. Like, it's, it's just, I, I have an equal opportunity roaster, like, I can go I through it. and talk shit and it. then shit on myself too. But no, it's, it's always, people have always said to me, like, you're really funny. You should go do stand up, go do stand up. I'm like, I'm funny on the spot. But when I had to think about it and create it, I didn't know if I could do that. Uh, one of my coworkers actually went into stand up first and they're like, bro, he was so, I'm like, he's so bad. And they're like, he's so bad. And to show him up, I decided to get on stage and okay. do it as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm curious. I was just kind of like, how, I mean, you, just, I mean, you skip the point there. Like, how did you just go all of a sudden? Because I would tell folks, everybody who's listening, watching this, he was very nice to me the other day. And you know, I was, I was like, it's the one thing I'm scared of doing. I know Mr. Fearless, I do everything else. Right. That's the one thing I'm scared of for some reason, stand up comedy. And you were just like, just mm -hmm. do it. And you told me your experience, your first experience. I'm like, you were very nice the other day to me. But I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I know so many comedian friends here in LA. I've had all, all this, I mean, just, I need, I need to do it. I need to do it. You're gonna uh, enjoy it more than you think you you will. I, I'm telling you, you you'd enjoy it a lot more than you think you would. I, I know you're probably right. No, you're probably right. You're probably right. But so you bombed. So as you said, you said you you bombed. It was horrible. So how did that feel? Well, that's the thing. So that feeling was terrible because I had so much anxiety. It was it was I was couldn't breathe, stuttering over my words, everything like that. The lights were so fucking bright, like you can't see the audience at all. Right. But here's the thing: the, my experience was I felt like I bombed. But when I got the video of it, like I told you, That's it right. actually ended up being nice. Like it ended up being going well. And I was like, okay. And people give me compliments after I'm like, y'all are being nice. Like, thanks friends. But it was, it was really like, they were like, you did some really solid work up there. So that's when I was like, okay, let me try to continue to do this. And I started doing it more and more and it, and it got comfortable. The, the weird thing about stand up and performing live in general, I'm not sure if you've heard any kind of stage plays or anything, but well, I've done live stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you have. I already knew the answer to that. Uh, you know, the anxiety is all there. Like ahead of time, it's all scary. What am I going to do? It's going to suck. Everything's terrible. And then when you're done, the high you get because it went well is, and it goes on for so long. Uh, that, a that's a different type of feel, you know? And that that high is what kept me going more and more. Like every time, I think the thing was, I became a yes man. Any, any kind of opportunity came towards me. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll figure it out later, but I'll do it. Let's go. Yeah, that's so, me. I know. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. yeah. No, your job. That's it. Let's go. It's, a, it's so okay. So I've seen some of your stand-up specials you posted online, and they're and they're good. They're funny. So it's about your family, dating, whatever, <laughs> that fun stuff. So these days, because I mean, right now, I mean, you did you did an online thing that I you know I, I watched uh, not too long ago. But I mean, well, I have this two-part question. So one will be, what is what is your comedy consisting of these days? What are you thinking about? What are you writing? Like what is what's kind of coming up for you right now? So here's the weird thing, because at the beginning of the year, January 31st, 2020, I quit my day job so I can pursue comedy 100%. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <sighs> okay. Well, you know, still started, you right? I was, I, was so, I, was, I was getting bookings and stuff. I was getting paid for things. And I was like, oh, this is kind of neat. Like, I can, if I can do X, Y, and Z amount per, per week, I can make okay. this much money. I can continue to grow from there. I have this much in the savings. And then Corona hit. And then everything got shut down. So I was like, uh, oh, shit type stuff like right. i have no income coming in now all my stand-ups got canceled all the comedy festivals that we were in, i got into got canceled all that stuff um and that's when like you know i i work with rikishi from wbe he's a hall of famer and he he one thing he always says is adapt you have to adapt you have to adapt yeah. the world's gonna change you have to adapt yeah. Yeah. so it's weird because at that point when nothing was happening and that's when the production of the wrestling shows and stuff coming came into play where my creativity can go as yeah. far as comedy is concerned though uh, I focus 100% on the sitcom I've been writing. And it's just, a, it's just a funny sitcom that I've been writing for a few years now. And I just keep like putting a page or two in it every now and then. And it's starting to build out pretty nicely. And I thought that, you know, if I can't write for the stage, let me write for TV. Because at the end of all this, if someone needs a sitcom or something happens, I can be like, hey, let's see what we could do with this. You never know. You never know. Right. So the way I am is, is the stuff you guys see online and whatnot is probably like 10% of what I create in the background. 
and everything else just kind of sits there just in case everyone and anyone ever needs it. And when people need it, it's like, hey, hey, I got this real quick, or hey, we can do the promotion real quick, or whatever it is. So that, and then also I got uh, signed up by an app called the Stereo app, which have pays right. me to go on there and talk shit all day long and whatnot. So yeah, you know, that was fun too. That was a fun little outlet. I know Stereo. I know five folks on there. Folks are on there. Um, yeah. I mean, because I mean, because it's just it's you answered part of my question. Is it's just hard now because there's no stage. My word this year, every year I pick a word, and my word this year was stage. I thought more, I mean, part of it was stand-up. Part yep. of it was, I wrote a play. I was gonna try to produce that this year. Everything was gonna do at the stage. And I had a musician, so I was gonna do some dates. I had some things signed up. Yep. March 17th yep. is my date. <laughs> they know, living in for me. Where <laughs> shit just went, eh. That was it. it was like, Done. like that record stopping, eh. Like, that was it. Yep. And so it's funny you said that, because I'm like, I was, that was like, sure, stage, James. Stage. Yep. And no. Yeah, that virtual show was pretty fun, but it wasn't as fun as I wanted it to be. Um, what I was going to do is add like a laugh track, but that's like, oh, God, I hate laugh tracks. But I, so I left everyone's mics on to hear people laughing and then it got overbearing. Right. Because yeah. it, when, the way Zoom works is when one person is speaking, the other mics yeah. cut off. Yeah. So so it got it was OK overall. It was actually a, a, one thing I love, though, is how much money I ended up raising with it and how much money we all ended up making off of it, which was nice. Um, because that was an accomplishment, knowing, thinking, can I produce something and get people to tune in and, and all that stuff, which they did. It's not the same without a crowd. You, like, you got to listen to people talk. I need someone to be drunk in the corner. I need that, to be, right, exactly, I exactly. Surprise. Like, I, it's, it's so much more fun when you're, you're having fun with other people, you know, and they're engaged. And you can't engage people when you can't see them. True. You know? Is there, is there, are there subjects that are off limits for you in terms of comedy? No, no. I don't, I don't, I don't. I've always hated um, censoring people, no matter how bad their mindset is, because the only way to understand one another and be able to fix it is to hear everyone's thoughts, right? Like, if I don't know what you're thinking, if you're sitting there in your head, like, God damn, I hate these fucking brown people. But you're around me like, hi, how are you? Da, da. And then behind my back, you're like, subconsciously even stopping me from some kind of blessings coming up, right? Like, the, unless we talk about it, like, there's no way for us to get around. It. And I think as comedians, everything can be funny. Everything can be funny, but timing is also everything at the same time. You know, if we're if we're if we're facing the Me Too movement right now, then please keep the rape rape jokes away right now, just for sensitivity purposes, right? right? Like, like that's it's just about timing, really. It's, it's current events and what's going on right now. You shouldn't um, not at the expense of people's lives. Like that's that's my my take on it. Is like if you're not if you're not if you're making fun of something that's tragic that just happened, it's like a fresh wound. It'll never get a laugh. Yeah. You'll never get a laugh. Unless it's unless you're you're doing stand up to the rapist themselves, then maybe they'll laugh about it because that's good for them. Right, it's good for them. Yeah, they yeah. get it. They get it. Yeah, they uh, get it. <laughs> they get it. They get it. Like, <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, no, I totally agree with that. I think um, timing is everything. And I remember when nine eleven happened, that was the closest to where we were like, can we be funny? Like I'm thinking we need because I mean I have, I, have, I have a lot of comedian friends now, like a lot. You probably know a lot of the same people. Who knows? Um, who came on, my, came on the show and told me about the whole tension release thing about the comedy is that when there's a lot of tension, it needs to be released somehow. And laughter, right. of course, I mean, it is the best, it really is the best medicine. I mean, as I don't right. say, but I think it's really true. Um, you gotta be silly and have fun, and then you have to find a way. And comedians are great because you guys are observers, you guys are, you guys grab things in the, in the consciousness that we all know. Yep, find a way to filter it. Through, a, through your own lens, whatever lens that is, they'd be funny. I love yeah. that. Yeah, that, I mean, that, and that's, that's what comedy is at the end of the day. I think that's that you hit the nail on the head. It's a connection, right? If you're, if you're, people are tense, you're tense, and you make a joke that helps you guys kind of connect with one another, there's a way to present a joke that's funny versus offensive. And a lot of people know that. A lot of good comedians know how to do that. It's the ones that are not good who just want to be offensive for that shock value that's like, come on. Oh, here's an example. I was in Orlando and I did one stand up in Orlando one time for my family and everyone to come see, which was great. Orlando improv. Um, and there's a bunch of comedians there and there's one white kid who walks in and they all know each other. So this is something I'm the outcast here. He walks in and he goes up to the, one of the, the main black guys there and he says, Hey, I have a joke. I want to run it by you. It has the N word in it. How do you feel about me saying it? And I'm like, well, in my mind, it says, if you had to ask somebody, then you probably shouldn't be saying it. Right. Like that's that should give you the, the giver right there. So he did end up not. He's like, oh, it's so fun. And then the black guy said, because in the South, every, like the, the blacks are not as as uh, um, don't say the N word as they are everywhere else. And he's like, you know, it's a really funny joke. And it's a shame you can't say it because of the society we live in. And it's like, that's the shame. Really? 
you the shame is not the fact that his his mom and dad or his great grandpa was like beating your great grandpa that's not the shame come on man like this is the most ignorant thing i've ever seen in my life and then i got on stage i swear to god orlando's so racist because i said my la jokes are not going to work here my liberal la jokes are not going to work here so i said you know guys i'm going to go off top and I, I see that you guys are some racist motherfuckers so let's go to town and i went in on the audience man it was so much fun everyone laughed so much i forgot okay. about the time and it just turned out to be one of the, and everyone's like, this was the one of the best show stand-ups you have ever did. And I'm like, cause I was ranting, you know, but it was all like fun and games. We, I made it fun of everyone, including my own siblings, including my own people, but then their people, everyone else's people. You and adapted. in a way just like, yeah, correct. We adapted. You adapted. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, seriously, I like, I mean, you adapted. I mean, that's, I mean, it's kind of, I, you know, and that's the thing because, you know, I, I've, I've shot across the country and I know different things and, and, and you have to, you have to know your audience. They say it all the yep. time, like, know your audience, no, read the room. Like, you know, like right. and, and we see people who come in and they don't read the room. It's completely like, hi, if you could be any more off base than you are right now, yep. you could be any more off base. Like, I mean, it's just completely like- <laughs> Exactly, just, exactly, dude. You know, and you know what I call those people? Those are, those people are, I call are narcissists. Here's why. They come off as in, and they, we get this a lot in wrestling, if, if anything. And they always come out there like, this is what I want to do. And it's like, okay, but is that what your audience wants? It's not about you. You're here giving them, they paid money okay. to come laugh or be entertained. Not so you can give them your version of what you think is funny, right? So, so if you're sitting there in a crowd full of 13 year old kids and you're trying to make jokes about getting a job, they're gonna be like, okay, this is, I mean, it could be funny, but it's not, it's not, it's not for them, right? Know your audience is a huge thing, but that's, that's that whole, you just wanna be on stage and, and come off as a big man. You don't really wanna entertain people, and make them laugh. And that's where, where I see the difference between the two. Yeah. Now you're in with the Samoans. I was making a joke earlier at the beginning of the top of the hour. It's like you with the Samoans because the Rikishi show and all that. So I'm seeing that part of your wrestling stuff is with them. Can you kind yeah. of talk about that? I mean, like, I mean, that's like, we have Samoans in California. They're they're out here. We had, we I had them. You know, I grew up with them here in Inglewood and stuff. So I'm there. And I love I love I love some Pacific Islanders. I do. <laughs> I do. Um, so, so how did you get involved with all that? So so I'm uh, again. It's just I've always been one of those people that's like reaches out when I want to do something, right? Like if I really want to do something, I, I just reach out and ask. So um, <clears throat> I reached out to them. This is a really funny story, actually. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a kind of a long one. Okay, so <laughs> I reached out to them at the beginning of <clears throat> was it 2019? Yeah, 2019. And I said, hey, I want to check out your domain. I've always wanted to be a wrestler. I just don't know if I I don't know what the ring feels like. I don't know if I can do it. But man, I would love to try it out. And they said, sorry, our, our domain's closed right now. We'll let you know when we reopen. So that didn't go through. Uh, a few months later, I met a friend of mine who was uh, Taylor Gates. She was with After Buzz. I love Taylor. Okay, I love right. Her. So I worked with Taylor. I worked with Taylor. Oh, I love Taylor and, very much. And I was like, Taylor, man, I would love to do something like that. Like, I, I loved watching After Buzz, the NXT stuff that they did at Raw, SmackDown. So let me, you know, let me try to get in with them. So I went and auditioned with them um, and did the whole process and everything in April. And then he got back to me and they were like, sorry, it's not gonna, it's a no, right? So I was like, fuck, okay. So my podcast dreams are dying. My, my, my <laughs> wrestling dreams are dying. What's happening? <laughs> and then, so, so then... Uh, come July, I got reached out by one of the Samoan guys, Reno. And this family's big in wrestling, by the way. They're related to The Rock and Roman Reigns, okay. Jey Uso, like all them. Jey Uso is Rikishi's son. Roman Reigns is his nephew. Okay. So they reached out. They're like, hey, we got a new place. And I'm like, oh, shit. I really thought they looked at my pictures and stuff. I'm like, this little guy, fuck him. Like, right, we need right. a wrestler, right? <laughs> but they're like, hey, we reopened. Come check us out. So I went down there to check them out one day. And Rikishi was there. And we just started talking. And he was very like, welcoming and things like that so i signed up for knox pro academy a week no two weeks later because they saw how i was i'm very respectful i'm very much like i come in i used to clean the domain the first thing i did when i got there was i would sweep and clean the domain so we're not falling on dust and dirt and stuff you know and he loved that so they had they said hey we have a guest coming on sunday i was wondering if you could stay back a couple hours and just lock up afterwards and this was in front of everybody so i'm new wondering why but they they obviously were trusting me with whoever this guest yeah, was yeah so in come the guests. Obviously, it's Daria, Sonia Deville, X Pac, and Maria Menounos. I know X Pac, and of course, yeah. of course, yes, of course. And then Maria is actually going to do a guest referee spot on SmackDown, so they came there to, there to train. So I said, "Hey guys, I'm only here to lock up afterwards. If y'all need anything, let me know. I got y'all some water and stuff." And they're like, "Hey, actually, can you come in the ring?" And then Sonia Deville kicked my ass in the ring for like 45 minutes while X Pac taught Maria Menounos how to count to three. You oh, know? Okay. Oh, fun. After it was all said and done, uh, I would, they were like, they, all three of them approached me. They were like, dude, you know, thank you so much for the hospitality. Thanks for not being like a fucking fan because Xbox was one of my favorite wrestlers growing up. 
And and they go, and then I was like, thank you, thank you. And I said, I said to Maria, I'm like, you know, I actually auditioned for After Buzz. And she goes, did you? She goes, you look so familiar. In my mind, I'm like, no, I don't. But I'm like, all right. Um, you know, I'm like, that's a nice thing for you to say. Long story short, she goes, what's your name again? And I, and I gave it to her and she texted Roxy. And then Roxy emailed me and was like, hey, can you come back in? And then I started working with After Buzz at that point as well. So now it's like full circle coming back. And then After Buzz shuts down. And then Rikishi likes what I was doing with After Buzz. So he's like, hey, you want to start our own podcast? And when a fucking WWE Hall of Famer said, right, you're like, uh, podcast, let me think about it for oh, a second. Hey. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go, man. So After Buzz, man, After Buzz has been, been like, it's so helpful to me because I learned so much there. And full circle with everything, like you just keep at it. That's the, that's the weird thing. You get so many no's and it always comes back to you somewhere down the line. It does. I, I've, I've, you're learning it early. I, I've always known that, but you're learning that early in life. Yeah. Um, it is. Um, okay, so you're like a little guy, aren't you? Aren't you like five? Five, two, seven. Two, five seven yeah I'm, I'm a small guy i'm a five seven but even though i don't look like that on the camera as i thought no, i did you don't, I actually don't. Seven. but i'm yeah. saying for, for wrestling is that small is that yeah that's small yeah very small because yeah. most of the guys i go up against like a lot of the guys there are six foot some of them are six four uh there's a seven foot guy like these guys are huge but the thing about wrestling that's fun is and the reason it's fun is because you get to you get to create a story off that right like if you're if you're seven feet tall and I'm five seven, I'm not gonna pick you up and body slam you. Right, right, right. So my my story I'm gonna tell you is that I'm gonna try to chop him down. I'm gonna go for his legs. I'm gonna try to work him, you know, uh, to where it gets me in the position where I can win. And that's what wrestling is: is positioning yourself for that W, just like any sport would be. NFL. Da, da, da. The, the difference is like it's more storytelling than it is com co a competition. That makes sense. That's just, that makes yeah. Sense. yeah. Um, so we mentioned you mentioned After Buzz because we both are After Buzz folks. I was an OG there. I was there six years. So yeah, like, you told me. Yeah, Shit. I know. I was like, I was an old timer. Um, did a lot of shows there. What is one thing you learned about yourself as a host? Uh, it's just I'm I'm better at speaking than I thought I was. You know, okay. that's one thing I learned, and I, and it's from a lot of feedback, not from the people I was working with, but more their family members would start hitting them up to give me messages, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Um, I'm also really good at bullshitting. I realized. And, and after Buzz, I'm sorry if you're listening to this, but they put me on the American Idol podcast. And I could give a fuck about American Idol. So I actually, during the quarantine time, uh, I didn't have ABC, so I couldn't watch it unless I watched it there, but we couldn't go there anymore. I would bullshit my way through every episode. And they're like, wow, that's an interesting, interesting insight. I'm like, wait, what? Like they're buying it. So I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And then that's where we ended up. That's hilarious. I did two shows. I've done over a thousand hours there. I did two shows where I, I did one show drunk <laughs> Again, i don't remember how i got home oh my god we gotta do a drunk we gotta do a drunk one of these that's awesome bring flobo oh, i we should we should actually um <laughs> I, i'm 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 fun drunk i mean i'm fun i'm not a me i'm having a good time uh but i don't remember how i got home um so i was like i can't do that again that was kind of crazy because the guests brought booze and we started drinking on camera and we and i hadn't eaten i get the lights whatever yeah uh, but i've done two shows where i will admit to you after everybody watching after buzz i bullshitted my way through um and one was hard because i do the soaps you really ah. your way through the soaps it's five oh. days a week uh-huh but i got called it and i just i just kind of was like Yes, and so that character is kind of crazy. You know, <laughs> that. <laughs> Whatever generic stuff you could say, like, like, yeah, she was she was definitely cheating on him. And yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Being her great uncle in disguise as a great grandmother, like you yeah, know. Exactly. I was I was very basic. I was like I was just kind of like I can, yeah sure. I mean oh yes, I've always liked that character. Yep, that's hilarious. So I did that, but it's hard. That's what I'm saying. You say you did that. It's, it's hard to, to I mean, it, it can, I can do it too, but it's, it's hard to, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, it's, Ameri it's American Idol. So to me, it was a little easier because it's a competition. So it's my opinions. So it would oh, be like, right. a, a, like a, man, that girl's voice, she sure knows how to project. And that, that, that control in her voice is amazing. They all have control. That's why they're on fucking American Idol. Like, come on. <laughs> you know? So they're like, wow, you're such a musical technical expert. I'm like, yeah, that, that vibrato, you heard that? Ah, oh, beautiful. <laughs> I love I love that I do. I and I told you before off camera. I'm sorry you get the full experience like I did there. I mean, I got a chance to be there for years, and um, Atmos did really help create. Um, I mean, I had I had my personality, right? but it helped me create the show running aspects and the kind of, yep. kind of and the, and the technical stuff. Like really, and the technical stuff. I actually, look mm -hmm. at the camera a certain way. It did help all that. So I'm sorry you get a chance to have a full experience of that because it's it's. It was valuable. It was very valuable. Yeah, it is. You know what? And it's, it's it, the reason I know it's valuable is because, like, there are certain things. Like, when I got on to NXT with Flobo, 
uh, he's really good at structuring his shows. So I would listen to the way he would say things. And I would say things like, like towards the end, like, so where can the good people find you if they want to look you up online and things like that, right? Uh, before we get to the end of the show, without further ado, things like that. And then I started saying that on our, our show with Rikishi and now Rikishi does it. So he oh, does the same. Yes, yeah, so I got to tell Flo about this too. He's, he uses the same formats that I used to because I used to lead the show. He didn't know how to. Then as he picked up on him, like, okay, it's your show. So you need to really, like, really lead it. He's like, yeah, absolutely. And now he does it in the same way, the same formats that we did. So I'm like, that's got to mean something, right? To like give that, impart that wisdom from one person to another as it gets to someone as the caliber of WWE Hall of Famer Rikishi. And he's learning from us as we're learning from him. Like, it's, it's insane to me. Yeah, after us, we, uh, after us did give us a structure on how to do shows. And that was something that um, Tony Moore, for me, who was an ex, ex after buzzer also, he got mm -hmm. me the structure. And so I took it and I ran with it and made it my own. Right, of course. My, my, as you'll hear my ending at the, at the end of the show, I end my shows the same way all the time as I have my saying. Whoops, and, did I give away your ending? <laughs> my, my ending, I always say, you can find me where I was introduced to Soul that James Lott Jr. and I, I mean, I say that. People laugh all the time when I say that. Right. That's my, that's my signature ending. I've always said that. Um, and I think, but it helped you develop those kind of things of like, what is your saying? What is your... Right. TV, like, I, I didn't... I, you can't cuss after bus TV. Um, I'm, I'm a truck, muscle truck driver. I had to say, like, cheese and crackers and God bless America <laughs> and kiss my grits. And then those, those are things I would say. Yeah. Uh, and now my fans know, though. They know those things. <laughs> I, I couldn't say... Fuck or shit. I, mean, I, couldn't, I couldn't say any of those things. So I would say, God bless America. So, <laughs> so now the fans love that. And it's just this weird thing. But it right. that helped develop that for me in a structure that... You could take anywhere with you. Like you literally, you say you're taking it anywhere with you, and it mm -hmm, works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so working with the Samoans, do you find anything in common? Yeah, actually a lot. The uh, Rikishi calls me his son. I call him my dad because he reminds me of my dad. Uh, culture is very strong with them. The same thing. It's kind of the same kind of concept. Um, what's actually really funny is growing up because you know how you said other, right? We were the other male. When I would check off, because I didn't, I didn't realize I was Asian back then. I used to think Asian was Chinese, Japanese uh -huh. only, but I am Asian. Just what? like even a Russian is an Asian, right? Yeah. So, 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 uh, I would put check off Pacific Islander because I was like, well, if Pakistan's in near the no wait, that's the Indian Ocean, and I was like, that's not right. But I would be Pacific Islander for like the longest time. That's but no, it's it's it's. Uh, I love their culture because it's it's they are very close as far as the family is concerned. And they all know each other and they all kind of help each other out. And you can tell that once they see one of their own kind come through those doors, they will put special like emphasis behind them to get them to go this direction and kind of build them up. Uh, but they're also very inviting. That's the one difference between our culture and theirs. Our culture is kind of, it, it, they'll talk to you, but for the most part, when it comes to having a family gathering stuff, it's just our people. Samoans, if they learn you and they love you, then they start calling you Oos, which is brother, and they invite you to all their stuff, and they, they include you in the family events and stuff like that. And Rikishi introduces me to all of his family members all the time, like, hey, this is Hamza. He's like my son, and, and you know, it's very, like, family-oriented. So I don't know. I love it. The culture is awesome to me. They, they are um, very proud people. I will say that, though. They are very, very proud of their culture. They very, very much love their, their designs and everything. They all have matching tattoos and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, a uh, hell of wrestlers, man. Samoans are, those guys were built to be wrestlers because every single one of them right now, I can say from the dynasty that I'm part of right now, there's probably like seven or eight of their family members in professional wrestling right now on the main stage. So, and it's constantly more and more being signed each time, which is crazy. Like if you're going to get in with some family wrestling wise, that's the family to get in with. Wow. So is, is, the, is one of your goals to be really a wrestler or, is, or more of a commentator? Like what, what, is, what is the role? What is, what is your wish? Well, my, I love wrestling in general. And I've gotten really good to a point of I can commentate. Yeah, I've been doing that. But it's not my go-to. That was just because I was good at talking. Um, being a wrestler or being a wrestler's manager, like a sidekick, would be fun oh, because okay. then I won't have to get as beat up all the time uh but also production production like i'm really good with production so the wrestling show you see every tuesday um a lot of us put a lot of effort into it but uh, it got where it is because of me because of the production aspect of it like it came with an idea of they were talking and they said hey let's ask comes about zoom because i knew about zoom can we do a show on zoom and i said absolutely and i showed them how to switch camera spotlight videos things like that this is before zoom was really like as robust as it is now the uh, director of operations there was like, no, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So then one day I decided to create a fake wrestling production in my own house with different cameras and cell phones set up, switch cameras, showed him how it would look, sound, all that stuff. And then they're like, wow, we got something here. 
uh, over the next six months, we built, I created all the graphics, the flyers, designs, all that stuff. Uh, we had our tech guy come out. Now we have seven HD cameras there, about 11 microphones, an entire commentary section, a production room, um, all that, all that set up. And now we have every Tuesday, a show coming on. And the way I am in wrestling, wrestling is one of those things where people really think it's scripted or something like that. It's not. You show up, you're booked to be there. You show up and they say, hey, today we're going to have you do this and you do that. And you're like, okay, let me come up with it right now if I can, because it's so improv. Like a lot, 98% of it is improv off the top, but you have to deliver the story that you're trying to tell. Right, right, right. So that's what I started doing. I just started showing up and wherever you guys need me. Like we had a commentator come down from TNA and TNA, uh, TNA is, a, is a wrestling promotion. He's a big, big time commentator. And he's like, I don't feel comfortable commentating with someone else. So even though it's my show, the trainers were like, hey, I think we're going to need to uh, pull, pull you off a commentary tonight. And I said, okay, that's fine. Okay. Absolutely. Let's go. And they're like, all right, well, they like that mentality of it. So they put me as an interviewer instead in the ring, which ended up being nice because the guy I interviewed was Sefa Fatu, who's major in the business right now. And when I put his clip up on Instagram, it ended up getting a lot of likes and followers and things like that. So it all worked out. So then I'm flying back from Orlando recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I get a text from my manager or my uh, uh, trainer. And he says, hey, can you bring your wrestling gear tomorrow when you come in? I was like, okay, what am I doing? He says, just bring everything. So I brought everything. He's like, this is what we're going to have you do. Go out there in the mic, cut a promo, cut a promo, like talk shit about people, and we'll see how it goes. And they enjoyed it so much. Now they're continuing a storyline. And now there's a storyline being built around me and my guy who I'm with, which is the mighty Maki. Hamza, you are amazing. I mean, you are. You're amazing. I tell you, I mean, I'm a fan of yours. And I'm, I'm, I'm just like, listen, I'm like, you are. I mean, you you have it. You have it. That's hey, man, thank you. Thank you. You do. You do. I mean, I, I'm i amazed by the younger generation. I'm like, I love it. I'm just like, this is, this is like, it's, this is very inspiring. I mean, you just like, you're, you're finding your way through the things you want to do. That, that's, hey, the, that's the lesson. That's the lesson. I try, you know, I try to tell my siblings, the younger ones, this. I'm like, the way I kind of started looking at life now is, Every single, we expect every day to be the same. You wake up, you eat breakfast, you go to work, you come home, you watch your favorite shows, you fall asleep. However, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, as like a Mario Brothers game, right? Every level is different. And you have to use the skill sets from the days before to get through the next level, but there's gonna be some surprises, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to every day wake up knowing this is my routine. And as soon as a kink comes in the way where it throws it off, then I'm gonna need to uh, adapt and go around it. And I just learned a new skill set I can use in the next level coming up. That's like the best way to explain it, in my opinion. I, well, I completely agree with you. I, I, that's, I can't even disagree with that. Um, your birthday is coming up in a few weeks. Um, and you know, you know why you talk so well? Because you're a Sagittarius. That's it. I've been told that many that's times. They talk. They're good talk. You know, everyone would say to me all the time, like, what's your sign, Sagittarius? I don't pay attention to signs like that. They're like, what's your sign? I'm like, Sagittarius. Oh, that makes sense. That makes like, sense. I've gotten totally them my whole life. Totally yeah. does. Totally does. Makes sense. Um, and you're hitting 34. So I'm hitting towards the mid 30s. Um, what does that mean to you right now? When you're in your life right now? Absolutely nothing. Uh, it really doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it's again, it's, it goes back to the same thing of, of, of trying to put the same daily routines onto everybody, right? Like people say I'm 34, so I have to do this or I must be that, or this is where I'm at in my life. And I hate looking at it that way because there's a lot of people that, that made it bigger in their life because they didn't stop in the age of 45, 50, 60 years old. And it's, 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 it doesn't make sense for me to settle down and do something I don't want to do right now because I'm 34. Because at the end of the day, I'm not, a, I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not a female, right? I can't, I don't have my reproduction, reproduction stuff's not going to stop. No. So to me, I don't have a timeline. So the only thing that means to me is, is shit, thank you for another year. Let's keep going. What's next? No, it's funny. I, I'm glad you said it because I tell people all the time because I'm 51, I'll be 52. And I didn't start till I was 32. Hey, looking young, looking young, looking 32, 33 right there, okay. Black yeah. don't crack. We all already, already know that, yep. No. <laughs> you said it for me, I have to say it. <clears throat> to say that. But I'm, but I am, I'm 51 years, I'll be 52 in May. And and I started this business 13 years, I just started 13 years in the business. And I was 38. Ooh. So I'm just saying, what you're saying, I want everybody who's younger to hear you, just keep going you don't, you don't have to stop. And, it's like, and yep. you don't have to worry about if I'm not 40 years old and didn't, ma didn't make it. Yep. Uh, it, it that's not the point. And, that's right. the and I'm still getting new stuff in my 50s. I mean, it's like, it's just completely, the, the, I guess you have the same attitude I do or similar attitude. As long as I continue to do this, I can do this every day, no matter what it is, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. It's all simple, man. It's very simple. And, and then the other thing is this, a lot of people look at this stuff too. They're like, what, it, and I'm sure you think of this too, man, how far along would I have been if I started at 20? Yeah. I say that to myself all the time. Like, what if I just started then? Well, guess what? I wouldn't have been far along because 
the person I was at 25 would not be likable as a person I am today. So the people I'm working with, if I, if I started then, they probably would have given up on me because of the type of attitude and mentality I had back then, right? So it's like, a, it's like a, everything comes in the right time. And it's like, yes. now I know why I was supposed to wait this long and where I, how I was supposed to get comfortable in front of the camera and in front of people and stuff like that, because back then I wouldn't have been able to pull it off. Yep, I agree. Oh, look, I think. Right. And I would have had more energy, but that's about it. <laughs> But you can have energy. I've got a lot of energy, and I'm and I'm older than you. I have a lot of energy, so you can have a lot of energy still. It just the recovery time is a little harder when you get older. <laughs> I don't I'm I know that? I'm just like, why? What's that noise? Well, that's me. Yep. Out of bed. Okay, that's my noise. Okay, got it. Well, what? Okay. Give yourself a chiropractic adjustment. Just getting out of bed, right? Exactly. Exactly. I think things are cracking and popping and crackling. I'm like, I'm like more noise. Is that my new song? My next single? <laughs> my body cracking in the morning. Cracking and popping. <laughs> Oh, it's like sometimes I'm like, oh, it is me. Um, but yeah, that's no, great. You are, Hamza, you are amazing. You are, you are, I, anything Thank I can you, do man. to help you out, I'm here. Just want you to know that you're part of the family. Whatever you need, I'm here to support you. I'll retweet whatever, whatever you need. You are amazing. You are, you have it. You do have it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's crazy. And I, and I, and I hope that, you know what thing that made me very happy though recently that was really cool is I have one fan in Pakistan. One. All right. I could be more uh, for all I know, but one like fan who, who reached out to me and he was like, Oh my God, you do the wrestling. I love Roman Reigns and Jey Uso. He loves the Samoan family and everything. And then he drew a picture of me. And I he said, and, like, and I was like, God, this is so awesome. Like, it's, it, that's weird. That's so weird to me. That's so weird. But representation cool. matters. Right. Representation I, matters. Right. And then it really does because now looking back, growing up, Saved by the Bell, I mean, everything you used to watch, there was no Pakistani people in any of those shows. There'd be an Indian guy who would be a grocery store owner or a convenience store owner, right? Yep. And that's when everyone started telling me like, oh, why do you people, all your people own grocery stores? And, and to the blacks, I would say, why do you people rob all the grocery stores? And then to the Spanish, I'd say, why do you people clean all the grocery stores? Like, this is, this is stupid. Like, what are we talking about? But no, I had no idea what I was supposed to look like or be in and everything like that. And that's what I'm hoping to kind of give back to my people. Cause there's a lot of people I know that grow up in this, the same type of setting I do, but we just don't talk about it. Yeah. And everyone, we all have two personalities. We have that one. We show our, our people and our, and our families. And then we have the one that we are really are. And it's a shame because the ones we really are are really awesome people. And I want to make sure that we can all kind of share it with one another. It's very true. And a lot of us, a lot of us have dual <laughs> things. We do that. And they, they, right. they, call, they call it code switching codes, all these different things. It's all, you know, all that stuff. So it's kind of like, right. that's what it is. And, you're right. If we could just have just one personality all the yep. time and be accepted on both sides, be better. But representation Good. really does matter. I think that I mean, really that's a very powerful thing. That someone is, someone to see themselves in you and whatever little tiny things you're doing, it's still right. a big difference. Exactly. Exactly. hundred percent. I like that. Hamza, okay, I'll tell folks where they can find you at all the <laughs> goodness. Well, for right now, you can still find me under my usual uh, stage performance name. So it's Hamza, H-U-M-Z-A underscore mania, M-A-N-I-A um, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Instagram is the only place I really post. So everything else is kind of whatever. Um, but also every Tuesday, I want you guys to check out Knox Pro. If you're wrestling fans, if you want or just want to check it out, Knox Pro Wrestling Academy on their Facebook, my Facebook. Uh, every Tuesday, we put on a show called Hashtag I Am Wrestling. And we created this show to help independent wrestlers, referees, managers get back in the ring because they also lost their platform for performances. So uh, again, Hamza underscore mania and Knox Pro Academy. And everybody, you can follow JLJ Media on all the social media platforms. We are, I mean, seriously, I'm everywhere from Spotify yeah. to iHeartRadio to Deezer, Cashbox, Pat. I mean, I'm everywhere. It's everywhere. You can just find this type of JLJ Media and my online network, JLJ Media, which is on YouTube. Uh, go ahead and type that in. I have over 35 shows ranging from Star Wars stuff to soaps and everything in between. And JLJ Christmas is coming out starting November 30th. My first audio Christmas series called Mr. Toro, which I wrote, produced, and directed. Um, and it's coming out, and it's, that's, that kicks off a whole month of Christmas goodness coming from JLJ Media. Take that, Hallmark Channel. Hey, uh, holly jolly. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, my stuff is good. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so that's coming out also. Um, uh, you can follow this, this show, Extra Connections. It's on Facebook. It's a page on Facebook, Extra Connections Show. You can follow me, of course. We're all James Law Juniors are sold at James Law Junior on all social media platforms. Even on TikTok, folks. I'm, I'm a TikTok star for some reason. I don't know how I, I did. I have over 3 million views. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing on there. But go ahead and check me out. See what I'm, what I'm talking about on there. It's, it's only a minute or less. So um, follow me there. Everyone, I know this is, it's a crazy time period in life. Have compassion. Be kind to each other. 
be careful out there. Like seriously, wipe down everything, wear a mask, wear whatever, take care of yourselves out there. Um, and we'll see you next time.